2 Samuel chapter 23, if you have a Bible with you and you want to turn there, 2 Samuel chapter 23. We are continuing in our No Little People series, Everybody Has a Story, and we are getting close to wrapping up this series. Yeah, you remember when we started, we said we hope that some of these names that are seemingly obscure in scripture, but we're learning that everybody has a powerful story. We're hoping that some of these names will be so memorable to you that when you and I get to heaven one day, we actually want to find Barzillai or Bezalel or Epaphras or Archippus or some of the others that we've been talking about. Tonight, we're going to talk about three names. Not just one, but three names tonight. That does not mean that we will be here all night. Does not mean that it will be three times as long as a normal sermon. We're going to be concise tonight. But we're talking about three of David's mighty men. Beginning in verse 13 of 2 Samuel 23, the word of the Lord says, During harvest time, three of the thirty chief men came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Now, if you don't understand what's happening there, that is what we call a drink offering to God. David, in fact, in that moment is saying by his action, he's not insulting these guys who risked their lives, but actually he's praising them and saying only God would be worthy of of such a sacrifice, so he pours it out as a drink offering before the Lord. In verse 17, he says, Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. And such were the exploits. In other words, these three men did many things like this, but such were the exploits of the three mighty men. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, that you would come by your Holy Spirit. We sense your presence here, Lord. I sense such a hunger in so many of our hearts for your presence. What a fantastic time of worship we have had. Lord, we know you're here, but would you make us aware of your presence? And would you help us, Lord, speak to us through your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. You can have a seat. All right, so um, let me... I am not really a movie person. Uh, It doesn't mean that I don't enjoy a good movie. It just means that normally there's not many good movies to be enjoyed. It's kind of what I'm saying. Um, And typically, generally speaking, not to be offensive, but I'd rather live my adventure than watch some fake adventure on TV. You know what I'm saying? Like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Like, just get out of the house, man. Go outside. It's good weather. You know what I'm saying? Go for a hike or something or build something or fight something. I don't know. That sort of thing. But... If I'm perfectly honest with you, there is one genre of movies. There is one type of movie that is very, very, very hard for me to resist. And that is anything that involves sword fighting. Anything of a brave heart kind of nature. It's just really... Now, I did watch King Arthur, and honestly, that disappointed me greatly. So sorry. Uh, you know, I get, I get, the, you know, I get modern kind of warfare. I get the fantasy kind of piece in that where stuff is blowing up crazy and there's magic and all that. But w- you know what I'm talking about is kind of hand to hand, mano a mano, like just fight that sort of thing. I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm just telling you um, that there's something there inside of me that likes that. Uh, just being honest. Now, I also love. Uh, when there is a Braveheart type movie, when there's a love story involved in that. I am, um, you probably don't know this about me, but I'm a hopeless romantic, actually, in heart. And uh, Mary's very aware of that. We just celebrated 25 years of marriage. Yeah. 
And so I love it. I love it when there's a kiss. I want there to be a kiss in the movie, but only after the fight. It's kind of like meaningless when it's just gratuitous. You know what I mean? It's got to like, anyway, it's got to happen afterwards. And more than the fight and more than the kiss, I think in a movie like Braveheart, the thing that really appeals to us, or at least for me, and I think so many of you too, is this sense of a noble purpose. It just still means something that there are still men in this world who are willing to die for what they believe in. So this sense of a noble purpose. John Eldridge wrote a book called Wild at Heart. And if you men have not read this, in fact, you ladies ought to read it too, because I know you don't understand us, nor do we understand you. And it just might help. Who knows? You might get something good from it. But guys, if you've not read Wild at Heart, what John Eldridge says is a great book, by the way. He says there are three longings in the heart of every man. These are God-given, he says. One is that every man wants a battle to fight. Now, of course, we understand. You, you realize we're talking about a spiritual battle. He says there's a battle to be fought. And secondly, there is a beauty to be rescued. We all long for that. And then thirdly, there is an adventure to be lived. So a battle to fight, a beauty to rescue, and an adventure to live. And if you've not read that, I encourage you to read it because so much of that rings true to our experience as men. Now, with that said, if you have read that, then I would encourage you to take it up a notch and read G.K. Chesterton, especially his book, Orthodoxy, which, by the way, he wrote at the age of 27, which is ridiculous. If you don't know G.K. Chesterton, he is, in essence, the brilliance of C.S. Lewis mashed with the backbone of Winston Churchill. He's got so much grit and so much uh, masculinity, and he's just incredibly brilliant. Again, Orthodoxy is the book that I would encourage you to read. It's kind of like uh, Wild at Heart times 10 or something like that. So all that, just a commercial to push you guys to be reading and thinking. Let's look now at what is called the Mighty Men of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, we read a bit of this, and we're going to read some more. But you can read all the way from uh, verse 8 all the way through verse 23. And by the way, there's a parallel passage where these mighty men are also listed in 1 Chronicles chapter 11. So if you want to go back and study this, 2 Samuel 23 and 1 Chronicles 11. And what we see here in the list of the mighty men, there are we're looking at what's called the three. And these are the three captains. They become the captains of hundreds of soldiers. Eventually, they become the captains of thousands of soldiers as David's army grows. After the three, which we're going to talk about tonight, there are what's called the two, which are over the three. And then after that, in your list, you'll see what is called the 30. And these are the 30 captains of David's army. There's actually 37 of them because these are warriors. And when they die, they're replaced. And so there's more than 30 names. But these are, if you will, the knights in shining armor of David's army. Now, let's go back to verse 8 and pick up because I want to name these three. And I want you to catch this. In verse 8, these are the names of David's mighty warriors. Josheb, Bashabeth, a Tachmanite. Okay, for, pause for a second. In 1 Chronicles, Josheb, Bashabeth is called Joshobim, and that's a whole lot easier for me to say. So, henceforward, his name is Joshobim, all right? So, Joshobim was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Pause. One guy with a spear against 800 dudes. Seriously, I don't think I could kill 800 squirrels. You know what I'm saying? Like, seriously, 800 squirrels attack me, I'm going to die. That's all. <laughs> like, how do, you do, how do you deal with that? 800 men, think about it. Come on. So he gets to be the chief of the three. Duh. All right? That's Joshua Beam. Next to him, in verse 9, was Eliezer, son of Dodai, the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamin for battle. So he taunted, he's the guy with the mouth. 
Don't know if you know anybody in the room here that's got a mouth that might taunt the enemy, but that's this guy, okay? Eliezer, he's the guy that's picking a fight. He's taunting the enemy, but he's picking a fight with a giant because the Philistines at this point are bigger and badder. And so it says the Israelites retreated, but in verse 10, but Eliezer stood his ground. And struck down the Philistines, watch this, till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. I didn't pull a bunch of these, but there are a lot of historical accounts throughout church history and um, in world history of men who fought so long and so hard that their hands cramped and their forearms cramped to the point where they couldn't actually, they had to, doctors had to peel their hand off of their weaponry. And that's what happened to Eliezer. His name, by the way, by the way, means the Lord is my helper. And so it says the Lord, not Eliezer, but the Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only after the battle was already done. They helped him pry his hand off the sword, right? That's Eliezer. So we got Joshua Beam and we got Eliezer. And the third next to him in verse 11 was Shammah, son of Agi, the Herorite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, that's a field of beans, Israel's troops fled from the Philistines, but Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. This guy said, you're not going to take my beans. You can steal a lot of things, but you're not getting my lentils, man. I'm... And he doesn't stand in the corner somewhere. He stands his ground right in the middle of the field. And he says, these are my beans. These are Israel's beans. You're not getting the beans. Everybody else ran away. And he stood his ground in the middle of the field of beans. And he defended it and struck the Philistines down. And again, the Lord brought about a great victory that day. So these are the names of the no little people that we're looking at tonight. Joshua Bean chief of the three, next to him, Eliezer, and next to him, Shammah. These are the guys that went on the adventure that we read about on that trip to the well at Bethlehem. And we're going to look in detail there, but before we get there, let's talk a little bit about who these guys were, where, where they actually came from. If you still have your Bible open to 1 Samuel 23, go back one chapter to 1 Samuel 22. And the scripture says in verse 1, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, why is David running? At this point, David has been chosen to be the king of Israel. And what I mean by that is he's been chosen by God as a man after God's own heart, and he's been anointed by the prophet Samuel, if you're familiar with the story. But there's a current king whose name is Saul, and he doesn't know yet, or he doesn't want to believe yet that David's going to be the real king. And he's in power, so he's actually trying to kill David. So David is fleeing because he's not willing to put his hands on the Lord's anointed. He's not willing to take the kingdom for himself. So he's running from Saul to allow God to do all of this. But Saul is trying to kill him. So David escaped from Gath and went to the cave of Adullam. Now, the scripture says, when his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. What you've got to realize is that Saul not only wants to kill David now, but he wants to wipe out his whole family. So even his father and his mother and his people, his brothers, they're all in danger now. So they also go into hiding to the cave of Adullam. In verse 2, here's where the mighty men start showing up. The scripture says in verse 2, all those who were in distress or in debt, or discontented, gathered around David, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him there. 400 guys come, that turns into 600, and it grows from there over time. But I want you to see who these guys were. All those who were in distress, or in debt, or discontented, came to David at the cave of Adullam. So at this point, David knows that he is called to be king. He knows he's called by God. And how many understand you can't do anything in the kingdom of God by yourself? You need a team. You need brothers. You need friends. And David, if you read the Psalms that he's writing in this uh, period of time, you see his loneliness and he's calling out to God for friendship and for a team and for an army. And God says, okay, I'll give you a team. Look who shows up. 
these are the men that begin to gather around him. The distressed, the indebted, and the discontented young men of his day. This is definitely not A-team material. It's a ragtag bunch of very young outsiders. People who are, think about this for a second. Does this sound familiar? People who are stressed out, people who are in debt, and people who are discontent. Almost sounds like a bunch of Samuelson State Chi Alpha dudes to me. <laughs> no offense intended, I are one. You, you understand what I'm saying? I'm one of you. But David took this group of young men and made them into great men. David began to love them. David began to disciple them. And David turned these men into an army. In fact, these distressed, indebted, discontented young men became one of the greatest armies, at least per capita, this world has ever known. And that's no exaggeration. Reminds me of what Jesus did. Jesus took a group of outsiders with attitudes too, didn't he? Fishermen and tax collectors and zealots and people just like you and me. And Jesus turned his disciples into men of God, a spiritual army, a salvation army that turned their world upside down. So it makes me ask this question. I wonder what kind of men and what kind of women you and I are becoming as Jesus puts his gracious hand upon us. Why are they recorded in Scripture? Now, this is interesting to me because there's almost two whole chapters given to the listing of the mighty men of David in the Bible. Why is so much real estate scripturally given to this listing of the mighty men? It really is not there for any real historical significance. In other words, if you were to remove the list, the, the playing out of the kingdom of Israel would not be, um, you wouldn't lose anything of historical significance. So why is it there? Well, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 talks about not only this list, but all of the ups and downs and the good and the bad of the Old Testament characters, he says this, now all these things happen to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Paul says all of these Old Testament characters, they're there for encouragement, they're there for warning, they're there for our admonition at the end of the days. You and I live in the end times. So in other words, these men are part of what we'd call the cloud of witnesses. Their lives speak to us. They inspire us. So let's look at their lives for just a moment and say, what is that going to show us tonight? What did they do? Well, remember, these were the days of David's rejection. He'd been called by God, but the people, Israel, they didn't know yet that David was God's man for this hour. And so these were the days of his rejection when he was in hiding. So these guys, their common cause was to protect and promote David as king, as the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. And in doing that, remember, it's the common cause, ladies and gentlemen, that give us the adventures in the kingdom of God that bind us together as brothers and sisters. It's a common cause that causes us to go into battle together, and it's the battle that we do together that causes us to fall in love as brothers and sisters. So they had many adventures together, and we're going to look at this one a little bit closer, this trip to Bethlehem for a drink of water. I believe this is a picture for us. It's an allegory, and I, um, I realize that this sounds so egocentric, and, and it, it is, but... I feel like this is so pertinent to us at Sam Houston Chi Alpha right now, that this story of what these three guys did together is so salient to where we are in Chi Alpha right now. It's so pertinent to who we are, and we can learn so much from this. And I believe the Lord is going to send us tonight from this cave, so to speak, in groups together, in small groups together, to have serious adventures for our King. So let's pay attention just for the next few moments. I want you to notice a few things about this as I make this an allegory for us. Notice first that it was harvest time. 
the Philistines, as the enemy of Israel, attacked during the harvest time. And that's a smart tactic, isn't it? Because if you can ruin the harvest of your enemy, you starve your enemy. So David and his men are hiding in the cave while the harvest is rotting on the vine. Or what's probably worse, the harvest is being used to feed the enemy's purpose. Now, Jesus spoke about lost souls as a harvest for you and I. In fact, in John chapter 4, he said, You say four more months and then the harvest, but I tell you the truth. Lift up your eyes now and look, because the fields are white unto harvest. Even now the fields are white unto harvest. So we, as Chi Alpha, we're supposed to go and gather the harvest. What that means is we're supposed to go, like so many of you did, on spring break, and we're supposed to preach And we're supposed to share our testimonies. And we're supposed to lead people to Christ. We are his ambassadors, right? You see, every Christian, every Chi Alpha, has a responsibility to share the gospel. But too often, we're back in the cave hiding out. But not these three. They decide to get out of the cave. And they made a break. And they crossed the enemy lines. I want you to see the devotion of these three. Remember, we're talking about Joshua Beam, we're talking about Eliezer, and we're talking about Shama. I want you to see how much they loved their king, David. David had this longing. You see, he, um, he grew up in Bethlehem, and he's here and hiding at this point in this cave, and I can, in my mind's eye, if you forgive me for just thinking about this this way and having a little bit of an imagination, I The geographers tell us that in that area there are huge caves where hundreds of people can hide, and we think we know where actually the cave of Adullam actually was. And so there's these men, these hundreds of men, and I don't know what they were all up to. Maybe they're sharpening their swords or or polishing their armor or whatever they're doing. But what I see in my mind's eye is David stepping out in this mountain cave at the edge of this cliff, and he's looking out. And if you've never been to that part of the world, you can, on a clear day, you can just see for miles and miles and miles. And he's looking out, and he sees the town of Bethlehem. It's about eight miles away. And he probably can't see the actual well, but I bet he can see the wall and the gate around the city, and he can see it out there somewhere. And David, at this point, he's running. He's running from Israel. He's running from the Philistines. He's like, if you've ever been bird hunting, you shoot a cubby of quail. You shoot at them, they get up, and they go over to another field, and then somebody over there shoots at them, and then they go over here. And David's like, golly, man, everywhere I go, somebody's trying to kill me. And he's just so tired of all of that. And it's harvest time, and he's in this cave, and he's hot, and he's sweaty, and he just remembers when he was a boy in Bethlehem. That was his hometown. And he can see it out there, and he's just remembering that water at the well on a hot day when he could get a, a drink of that water. And you know how sometimes when you're reminiscent, you just you, you almost overthink something. It's like that was the best water of any water on the, on the planet. If I could just, and, and he doesn't command anybody. He j- it's just kind of a sigh or a longing that comes from his heart. And he just says, oh, that someone would give me a drink. From the water, from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. And in my mind's eye, I see him just go back to his business, to what was happening in the cave. And then about that time, these three, the three mighty men, somehow they were kind of, they were close enough to David to hear what he said. And when he walked away, Joshua Beam looked over at Eliezer and said, did you hear that? And Shama says, I heard it. What are we going to do about it? Well, he didn't command us to go. Yeah, but he didn't tell us we couldn't go. <laughs> what are we going to do? He said, I tell you what, one hour after sundown, meet me at the base of this mountain. Bring your gear. We're going to get our king a cup of water. And these guys, the scripture says they break through enemy lines. Now, it doesn't tell us about the whole adventure, but boy, what? I mean, it's, it's eight miles, maybe 10 miles there, and eight miles, maybe 10 miles back. I mean, this is an all night adventure. And somehow, in my mind's eye, I see them at the well, you know, and they're trying to get this water, and it's probably 50 feet deep, and they've dropped the bucket down, and they're trying to pull it up. And, you know, Eliezer, he's a smart mouth. He's like, hey, come on, Joshua Beam, come on. What are you doing, man? 
get out of the way. Let me do it. No, no, no. Shh, shh. And Shama's like, shh, shh, shh. Here they come. Here they come. Look out, look out, look out. And then finally, after all this time, they get the water, and they put it in this little flask or something. They fold it up, and he puts it in his cloak, and then they turn around. And the three of them form a wall. And they begin to march their way eight miles back to their king. Now, I don't know what that night was like and all the adventures. And the Bible doesn't even tell us if they lived to be old men because at this time they were probably in their 20s. But can you imagine if they lived into their 50s or 60s or even maybe their 70s when they had a hard time even getting up? Can you? I, I just see them sometime having some reunion somewhere and they're eating and they go, hey, does anybody remember that time? <laughs> anybody remember that night? when we broke through the Philistine lines just to get David a cup of water, and they just relive what happened that night. And they bring the water back to David, and we already read the story about what David did as he poured that out as an offering to God, which made it even more meaningful, not less meaningful. Why would they do such a thing? Why would these men risk their lives just for a drink of water for a thirsty King David. Very simply put, because they loved him. We've said this before, let me say it again. Men will do things for love that they would do for no other reason. It wasn't duty, and it wasn't for fame. It was their love for their king that compelled their service. And if men will do that for a cup of reminiscent, symbolic water, how much more should you and I be devoted to Jesus? And honestly, right, he's the one who broke through enemy lines for us. Not for symbolic water, but to bring us living water. He said the kind of water that if you drink of, you'll never thirst again. And if men will do that for an imperfect king like King David, how much more should we be devoted to the true king, the perfect king, the king of all kings? King Jesus, David poured out this water as an offering to God, but we remember that Jesus poured out his blood as an offering to God. And the scripture says that Christ's love compels us. It's the love of God, his love for us, but also our love for him that compels us out of our comfort zone. We implore you, the scripture says, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. It's the love of God that compels us. Worship team, come please. So what is our response to this incredible story, this allegory, I believe, for Chi Alpha tonight. Well, it's pretty obvious, but let me say it this way. How many saw it? We're just like them. Now, not to put it too harshly, but we're just a bunch of young punks, a bunch of young losers that have been changed by the grace of God. We are a bunch of B-teamers who have become A-teamers because God put his gracious hand upon our lives. If that's offensive to you, remember that in Scripture, Paul told the Corinthians, remember what you were, brothers, when you were called. Not many of you were wise by this world's standards. Not many of you were influential or of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the things which are not to nullify the things which are so that no one can boast before him. That is good news. That's you and me. We were B-teamers. Now we're A-teamers. And that is the story of Sam Houston State, Chi Alpha. The gracious hand of God has been placed upon us. And we have been changed. And he's made us into a family and into an army. And we still have a purpose to bring glory and honor to our king. And it's a purpose that's higher than their purpose that we read about because our king is greater than their king, King Jesus. And it's still harvest time. And Jesus still says the harvest is plentiful and it's ripe. 
And there's still an enemy that's attacking the harvest and trying to push us as Chi Alpha into a cave. So the question becomes, where are the mighty men of Chi Alpha? Where are the mighty women of Chi Alpha? You say, man, I'm no mighty man. I'm weak and I'm frail. Yeah, but the scripture says when you're weak, that's when you're strong. You say, I can't rescue lost souls. I don't know what to say. Yeah, but the scripture says when you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit's going to tell you what to say. You say, but I'm just normal. I'm just ordinary. Exactly. That's the point. G.K. Chesterton, again, in Orthodoxy, he says, you know, the problem with the modern story is that the hero is extraordinary. Therefore, his adventures are always ordinary. But in the old stories and in the Bible, the hero was an ordinary human person who had extraordinary adventures because of an extraordinary God who filled him or her with his spirit. And that's why it's so interesting. And that's you and me. That's our story. You see, there are only three real nullifiers, disqualifications, so to speak, disqualifiers to keep you and me from becoming mighty in Christ. The first is compromise with sin. If you compromise with sin, that will nullify your ability to become a mighty woman or a mighty man of God. Don't play with sin. If you're living in sin and you're calling yourself a Christian, you need to bring that into the light tonight. You need to stop messing with that thing. You need to go tonight to your small group leader, to your resource leader, to your pastor, and you need to confess that thing and bring it into the light so that that will not nullify what God wants to do in you and through you. Compromise with sin will nullify. Complacency will also nullify. Complacency is just simply an I don't care attitude. I don't care about the broken heart of my king. I don't care what he wants, nor do I care about the lost souls on my campus. I just don't care. Complacency will nullify. And then thirdly, cowardice will nullify. I'm just going to hide out here in the cave. I'm not going to step out. I'm not going to join that adventure. Compromise, complacency, and cowardice will nullify. Well, if those are the nullifiers, what are the qualifiers? You already know what they are. We talk about them every single week here. I won't preach them again. Let me just remind you. Assuming that you're born again, you really know Jesus. Assuming you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's really only three things that you need to know in order to be a mighty man or a mighty woman of God. The first one is a devotional life. Did you catch that in our story? It was their devotional life, their ability to be close to their king, to hear his heart. That led to responsibility, which is the second thing, because his wish became their command, which brought them together as a band of brothers because they couldn't do it alone. So our devotional life, we've got to get close enough to hear his heart. That leads to responsibility because his wish becomes our command. And then we band together with like-minded believers. Devotional life, responsibility, brotherhood, and sisterhood. We know these things. This is who we are. Let's stand together. Here's how we're going to end tonight. And I, it's such a good feeling when you, when the Lord births a message in your heart and then you show up and you realize that um, you're kind of getting to preach to the choir and affirm what's already stirring in the spirit. I watched you guys as you went after God earlier tonight during worship and there's such an obvious hunger in this room tonight that is beautiful. I'm talking about getting out of our comfort zone and binding together to go share the love of Jesus. And half of you in the room, you did that very thing just last week. You sacrificed your spring break. You paid a lot of money. You, you made great sacrifice to go do the very thing we're preaching about. So I'm preaching to the choir tonight in so many ways. And that's the best, most fun kind of preaching. You don't tend to get stoned preaching at the choir. 
which is good. I want to affirm that. I want to I want to encourage what the Lord is already stirring among us. I want us to hear very plainly. It was already said in a testimony tonight, but hear me say, if we did it in Oregon, if we did it in Cairo, if we did it in Greece, what the Lord wants to say is we can do it at Sam Houston State University. You see, there's still a longing in our king's heart. There's still, if you get close enough, there's still a sigh that you'll hear roll off of his lips. You see, you can't study the life of Jesus without seeing his heart broken for lost souls. There is, in fact, pain in the heart of God over the lostness of mankind. The question is, can we hear that? Isaiah heard it in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah said then, I said, Here am I. Send me. I believe if we get close enough tonight, we'll not only hear the heart of Jesus breaking for the nations, but we'll hear the heart of Jesus breaking for Sam Houston State University, for our campus. I believe that the Lord's going to speak to us in just a moment as we gather and we pray together in such a way that when we leave this place tonight, we're going to have a command from his voice, and we're going to bind together, and we're going to bring him cups of cold water to ease his pain and his broken heart. As we worship tonight, I'm going to pray and close us out, and the worship team's going to lead us. But as we worship tonight, I want to invite you, if you're willing, to find a place to pray in the front. That'd be awesome. Or if you want to stay where you're at, then make an altar of your seat, or you can stand and worship there. But what I want us to have is a posture of listening. And so often, rightly so, we bring our requests to God. But what if tonight... We just come to him with this posture of, Lord, is there anything that we can do for you? Is there anything that's on your heart that you would communicate to us that would become marching orders for us? Not that he needs us, but just so we could get close enough to hear the sigh of his heart. Not in any sort of way that we would be... uh, in duty, earning our salvation, not in any sort of meritorious way, but just out of great love for the one who gave it all for us.